Uh, before we begin our worship this morning, I wanted to share some information with you all uh, that's really not part of worship, nor is it very worshipful. Um, so uh, yesterday at our stated session meeting, I tendered my resignation as your minister of word and sacrament. It'll be effective June 30th, 2024. Uh, Betsy and I are especially grateful for your care and support during Ezra's early delivery and extended NICU stay. That outpouring of love will always, always stay with our family. While I'll no longer be your pastor, my family and I will still be your neighbors. Starting in the fall, I'll be begin full-time teaching at Faith Christian Academy. So don't hesitate to say hello to us if you see us around town or in the neighborhood. And please know that we will be keeping you all in our prayers, especially during the forthcoming transition. Moving forward, a special conversation and training session with the Reverend Dr. Carl Utley, our General Presbyter, is scheduled for June 4th. The Presbytery staff will walk alongside you at every step of the transition. And my plan is to take the last two weeks of June for vacation, since I have yet to utilize any of that leave time. Carl will be here to preach on June 23rd, and will be available, of course, to answer any questions regarding your next steps. The session has called a congregational meeting for June 9th for the purpose of dissolving the terms of call and the pastoral relationship. In Christ's service to you all and to the church, Reverend Eduardo Soto. Junior. Before we begin the worship service, I just wanted to say, um, I realized I was experiencing this from the other side because my husband is a pastor and we've left six churches and I didn't realize how it feels on this side and we're gonna miss you very much. And uh, now the Lord be with you. And also with you. Happy birthday. See all the red? It's Pentecost. It's the birthday of the church. Cue the confetti. <laughs> okay. What an exciting holy day. And about the only one that hasn't been commercialized. It's a day for us. Pentecost. The church. 
Welcome, it is a great privilege and honor to gather before the presence of Almighty God on this beautiful Lord's Day, and we are glad you are here with us. Today, God's law comes from 1 Corinthians 13, four through seven. Love, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Please join me in singing from the Hymns of Grace, number 319, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Please stand. <laughs> our sins. Lord, I am blind and ignorant. I cannot see through the consequences. Things that I think are for my advantage may prove to be a snare and a curse. But in your infinite wisdom, you know everything. So I resign my choice to you. Choose for me. And however your providence will order my affairs. Make me then as thankful for disappointment as I ought to be for success. Since you have spoken it, I fully assent, and I deliver up all the cheeky impudence of my reason to be chastised and tutored by faith. Amen. Let us take a moment of silent confession. Receive these words of comfort from 1 John. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The peace of Christ be with you. 
Please share a sign of Christian love with your neighbor. Peace be with you. our faith with words from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Church, what is it you believe? Just as God has determined that the elect shall be glorified, so too in the eternal and completely free purpose of his will, he has foreordained all the means by which that election is accomplished. And so those who are chosen, having fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ. They are effectually called to aid Christ by His Spirit working in them at the right time. And they are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by His power through faith unto salvation. Only the elect and no others are redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. This we confess and believe. Amen. Please be seated. Hear now the word of God from Hebrews 13. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through Jesus, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
us pray. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise which he spoke by Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us that he may incline our hearts to him to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated, and I'll call children forward. Every trace of fear was gone. 
right, thank you for that reminder for the fruit that should be indeed in all of us as we proclaim and live this life for Christ. We now enter the portion of our service. We lift up prayers for our families, for our friends, for the church, and for the world. You see your prayer request printed in the bulletin. Are there any others you wish to lift up at this time? Yes, Linda. We pray that God do a mighty work in their lives, and hopefully we know that God is strong, we know he's good, and we know that he can heal. So we pray for them, pray for peace for that family. I can imagine that's a lot of stress on them. So thank you. We'll, we'll keep them up in our prayers. Uh, Cynthia. Yes, today is my oldest grandson's birthday, but um, I wish uh, prayer for him because he started Absolutely. Well, you said you said he is going to a Bible study, no, or he? Oh, he was. He reads, the Bible he reads daily, it. But he's, yeah. I, just, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Well, I pray that God uh, uh, put the right person in his life to uh, to to explain. I, I imagine. I just think of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, yeah. and he just needed that that right person to come in uh, and to help unfold and unpack the the scriptures. So I pray for that. For him. Yes, Mark. Absolutely, we certainly, certainly pray for that. Pray that that, that, that match go well, and that uh, that's a very noble uh, act on her. So I, I appreciate her willingness, uh, and certainly pray for healing and for that recovery. So thank you. Yes, Jeannie. Mm-hmm. We'll pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith at Living Waters Church. So thank you, Jeannie. Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, Barbie. Prayers for you and your family and for all of us. Thank you. As we go through this transition. That's right. We certainly pray for transitions. There's a lot of transitions going on. Um, Certainly appreciate those prayers. I know we also got some transitions of life going on as well, graduations and jobs and new chapters closing and opening. So uh, we certainly pray that God guide all of us in the midst of these transitions. So thank you. Any other prayer requests? All right. Well, hearing none, then let us come to the Lord in prayer. (coughs) Holy God, we first of all want to praise you. We praise you for your great glory and your majesty on high. We, of course, get to experience glimpses of it in nature. Uh, We look upon the beauty of the flower and the the breathtaking view of an aurora borealis. We know that there's so much that can point us to your mighty work. But we also know that you reveal yourself most uh, explicitly to us in your word. And so, God, I thank you for that revelation of yourself, your love letter to the church. We praise you for your majesty and your glory revealed to us on the cross with Christ, our Lord and our Savior, dying for us. Lord, then as we look to him and we look to you and even we look upon the beauty of nature, we should then confess our own unworthiness to come before you. How often times have we fallen short of your glory? How how many times in our lives have we mocked or ignored your majesty. Lord, I pray that you forgive us. Forgive us when we fail to recognize your grace in our lives, in our world, and in our homes. God, I know that you are quick to forgive because that's who you are. 
And so we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you especially for your forgiveness seen in your Son, who brought, of course, the good news of the gospel to all people and who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you again for his great example that we can live into and imitate in our daily lives. I pray that you help us to do so as we continue our life of faith and hope and love. And as we continue to serve Christ in our community, we intercede on behalf of those in the world who need to hear this good news. For those who have never heard the gospel, I pray that you help us to be heralds of the good news. For those who have maybe had a taste of it or perhaps have lost interest in it, I pray that you help us to go and rekindle the, the spark for your grace and your love. And Lord, I pray for all those who are grieving, who find it hard. Lord, I pray that you give them your Holy Spirit and the peace that passes all understanding, which of course comes from the Prince of Peace. Of course, we are bold to pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we dive into our scripture this morning, are there any um, announcements or minutes for mission that it, we need to lift up? You see some announcements pretty in your bulletin. I'll be out of town this coming weekend, but Glenn will be here to preach. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a good time. Yes, ma'am. And, and that's to update the directory. We're going to try and update that on a yearly basis. Um, so we're, we're coming up to that one-year mark. So this is going to be one of the easiest ways to make sure all that info is, is correct. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And also, one more. Yep. <laughs> um, if you have a musical talent you'd like to share, please let us know so we can get you on the calendar for the summer. Or if you have someone in mind you would like to invite to come share their talent with us here, um, you can give me their information. You can contact them and let us know what Sunday they might be available. We'll plug them in. So, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Any other minutes for mission? All right. Well, hearing none, then let us come to the word of God in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for your word that you have handed down to us. We come before you humbly seeking your, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding of how we should live as your people here in this world. I pray for your wisdom that comes to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, whose source is Christ himself. Lord, may we listen to him, may we submit to him, and may we come to trust and obey him in all things. We pray all of this in his name. Amen and amen. Uh, so today, as uh, Cynthia reminded us, it's Pentecost Sunday. This is the birthday, uh, if you will, of the New Covenant Church. Um, and so to mark this particular day, this particular birthday, if you will, I wanted to bring this morning a more theological uh, but a highly applicable uh, message for you, uh, especially if, if you call yourself a, a Christian. This message is, is for you. Uh, which ideally is everyone in this room, but uh, again, I just say that. So if you claim membership in the body of Christ, so if you are a member of the body of Christ, um, this message is, is, is for you to hear. On top of that, this weekend we also uh, examined and will begin to install a new class of elders. Um, they uh, were examined, everything went, went well, everything was, uh, was fine, they're awaiting ordination. 
Um, and so this seems like a really appropriate time to refresh ourselves on what God's perspective is on eldership within this church. Um, so I've got two uh, passages, two texts. Instead of, uh, you know, traditional, we look at a big passage and we go through, um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of passages that deal with the subject of eldership. And of course, there are actually a great many. I have a, a big list. There's at least, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 different verses throughout the New Testament and even some in the Old Testament to help us understand what the Bible, how God views and understands eldership for his church. But I don't have time to go through all of those, so I've picked out two of them. All right? And the first comes to us from Acts chapter 20, and it's in verse 28, but let me give you just a little bit of background to what's going on in Acts chapter 20. Here the apostle Paul is, uh, is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's, he's stopping in uh, Miletus, um, and he's called for the elders of the church in Ephesus to meet him there, because he's got a word to have with them. And he gives them a whole, there's a whole lot there. Again, the, the verses 17 through 38 roughly tell his, his message to them. But I want to highlight one verse in particular, which is a charge that he gives to these Ephesian elders. And so he says to them in, uh, this is Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or elders. The shepherd, to, excuse me, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so the first thing I want to do this morning is lift up three observations just from this passage. Again, there, you could probably point to others. But from this passage, there are three observations for elders. So if you are an active elder or if you are one of our incoming elders, um, this is for you. So listen up, please. There are three things that you should uh, pay attention to, three observations for our elders. First, elders must attend to their own spiritual fortitude. Second, elders must be alert to the flock's spiritual maturity. And third, they must nourish the sheep of God's pasture. So those are three uh, observations that the elder should do in Paul's. I'm, I'm going to unpack those again. So. The first observation here that Paul makes is that elders must attend to their own spiritual fortitude. It's important that he starts there. Again, verse 28 starts off, be on guard for yourselves. So he starts with that. Uh, it makes me think of this idea of being on guard. Is this, It's not so much this idea of a defensive. That's usually how we, we think of a guard, is, is standing, onto the, standing there and, and you know, he's, he's waiting uh, to, to waiting for an attack type of thing. I don't think that's necessarily what he means by be on guard. In fact, I think he means a more offensive position, one that takes the lead, one that has a, a more activity to it, not so much standing back and waiting for things to happen, but an initiative. And of course, I do believe that elders should take initiative. And so if we're talking specifically about being on guard for themselves, that is for their own spiritual strength, for their own spiritual fortitude, uh, Christ, uh, elders, all Christians, but elders especially, should take the initiative to, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. He says, examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. And so we see that I think Paul tells us, understands that we, we should be examining ourselves. All Christians should. But the person who is an elder or desires to be an elder should especially examine their spiritual fortitude. But of course, that's a very big blanket statement, isn't it? You know, examine your spiritual fortitude. Well, how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, I'm going to give you six points. Um, and I'm going to give you six points, what I call the rubric of self-examination. I've drawn these uh, from portions of Scripture. I'm not, going to write, I'm not going to quote all the Bible verses, but I will tell you where you can find them. So if you want to jot them down and go back to them, in fact, I would encourage you to do that. It's good to test the spirits. Don't believe everything I say. Compare it to what the Word of God says. So the rubric of self-examination is, as I'm about to say, is are the following present in your life, and are they increasing? 
So both those aspects are important. Are they present and are they increasing? The first of which is trust in Christ. We get that from Hebrews 3.6. Do you trust in Christ? Again, it should be present and increasing. The second element for this rubric of self-examination comes from Matthew 7, verse 21. Obedience to God. Do you obey God? The third of this rubric is from Hebrews 12, 14, and it's growth in holiness. Are you growing in holiness? Number four, probably one that many of us know, we just heard from the choir, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Is the fruit of the Spirit present and increasing in your life? The fifth element of this rubric is a love for other Christians. We get that from 1 John 3.14. There should be a love for the brothers and sisters in Christ, a special love for them. But not only that, we get the final one, the sixth element of this rubric, which is being a positive influence on others. Are you an influence, a positive influence outside of the church? And we get that from Matthew 5.16. So let me repeat for you one more time this rubric of self-examination. Trust in Christ, obedience to God, growth in holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, love for other Christians, and a positive influence on others. And of course, you could probably add more to this if you wanted to, but these were just six that uh, I was able to quickly pull, pull out from Scripture. And so if the following are present in increasing in you, then you are doing a good job of guarding your own spiritual fortitude. If there's something lacking, then that's an opportunity to build it up. Again, part of being a Christian is about growing. No one ever becomes a Christian and is done and set, you're ready to go. No, I got all my Christianing done, I don't need to learn anything else. No, there is always room to grow. And again, these are six areas where they grow. So biblical eldership begins here. Biblical eldership begins in the heart. And it applies, in our case, in our language, both to teaching and ruling elders. All elders within the body of Christ must be fulfilling or doing this self-examination, this rubric, are the following increasing, are present and increasing. So that's the first call that Paul gives to elders, is to examine themselves, is to be on guard for themselves. But he doesn't stop there. Biblical elders, or all elders, must also be alert to the flock's spiritual maturity. So he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. There is, in, in, case, in that case, a responsibility that the elder has to be on the alert for the spiritual maturity of the flock. Those six principles that I just mentioned in that self-examination, that rubric, those are to be present in the elders. Why? Because they are examples to the flock. And we talked about that at our session retreat yesterday, how elders are an examples of Christ to his flock. And so that's why Paul starts with these, you know, this self-awareness, this be on guard for yourself. This self-awareness of spiritual fortitude produces an alertness in the elder. So if you think about even just not even inside the church, outside perhaps in the secular world, if you are aware of perhaps your own weakness, whatever that weakness might be, Aren't we oftentimes very quick to spot that same weakness in others? You know, if you're genuine, you're honest, you're aware of your weakness, you're probably going to spot that in others. You may also spot in others the strengths that maybe perhaps can complement your weakness and help you grow. That's the positive aspect. The negative aspect is you, you know, misery loves company, you start surrounding yourself with people of the same uh, disposition. So when you learn about yourself, or again in this particular instance, 
When you build up your own spiritual fortitude, your own spiritual awareness, it's going to create an alertness to it around you. And this is very important for the elder especially because the elder has a responsibility to be alert of spiritual maturity, the levels of spiritual maturity within a congregation. This is why, even if you think about you know, those of you who have been in uh, managerial positions or administrative positions, this is usually why you hire or appoint a more mature person for a position of management. You're not going to uh, appoint or, or hire an immature person who doesn't even know their own strengths or weaknesses and then expect them to manage people with their strengths and weaknesses. You, you're setting yourself up for failure. And so you put into place elders or, you know, again, in the business world or in the secular world, people who are mature, who have a matureness and awareness of themselves and of others. And so elders should be aware of spiritual maturity in themselves first. And that produces an alertness and awareness for spiritual maturity in others. But it doesn't stop there. Because an awareness of other people's strengths or weaknesses without some sort of application is simply gawking or gossip. And we know that the Bible speaks against those things. Because, of course, we oftentimes are fine with pointing out the failures in others. Oh, this person didn't do that good job, or that person said this thing and hurt my feelings, this and that and that. You know how it is. Those of you who've been in, in the, the business world, the secular world, you, you understand. People are like that. They're quick to point out faults. But what is the elder supposed to do? The elder, Paul says, must nourish the flock in spiritual maturity. So elders who are just aware of other people's faults and sins and not willing to get their hands dirty and to help those people mature in the faith, those are not elders, those are gawkers and gossips. And they should be disbarred. And so we see here that the elder must be willing to nourish the spiritual maturity of the flock. Hear what he says. You, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. To shepherd the church of God. The elders need to be self-aware. They need to be alert over the flock so that they can feed the flock. That language there of being a shepherd is that same language that Jesus spoke to Peter about when he brought him, you know, uh, on the shore in John, I think it's John chapter 21, after the resurrection, Jesus is eating fish for breakfast, and he, you know, gives, asks Peter three questions, the same question three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus, of course, giving Peter the opportunity to repent from his thrice denial, not but a, a few hours earlier. A few days earlier, excuse me. And so we see that um, in that conversation that Jesus has with, with Peter, he says, do you love me? Peter responds, yes, I do, three times. And three times Jesus commands Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed the flock. So we see that there is an important element of nourishing that the elders do within a congregation. Elders are not simply committee chairs. Those are helpful things. I'm not saying we shouldn't have those. But that's not your job. Your job is not to sit in a position of power. Your job is not on a board of directors or a board of trustees. Your job is to nourish the flock. Different people are going to come at, with different stages of maturity. That's life. And different people with different stages of maturity are obviously going to require different approaches to help them mature. I know several of you have been uh, uh, school teachers. You don't expect a fifth grader to respond well to a college level curriculum. And so you meet them where they are. The elder too, there must be a willingness to serve Christ 
that is in a manner that is befitting the context. Context is key. So again, your role as elders, I'll just repeat it one more time, is to, one, be aware of your own spiritual fortitude. You must be alert to the flock's spiritual maturity. And then in light of both of those things, you must be willing to nourish the sheep of God's pasture. But the Bible doesn't speak to elders alone. If you're not an elder, you have a responsibility too. And so for that, I want to jump to the letter to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, uh, this is near the end of this great letter uh, that uh, we don't really know who the author is. I personally, this is Ed Soto speaking, not anyone else. I think it's the Apostle Paul, but there are many great scholars who disagree with me, and, and that's fine. So the author here has written this, this massive letter to these uh, Jewish Christians. And he's coming to the end. This is Hebrews chapter 13, the end of his, of his great lesson. And he's talking here about what does it mean to be a pleasing sacrifice to God. If you are going to be a Christian, if you're going to, to claim Christ, who is the great high priest and who is the perfect king and who is that wonderful prophet, you know, all this is stuff that the Jews would have understood. If you're going to name him as that, what are you going to do about it? And in the midst of answering that question, he comes to chapter 13, verse 17. And he says this, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So I want to give you four observations for the laity, for those of you who aren't you know, elders, or don't desire to be elders or not an active elder. If you are a lay person, these are for you. One, the laity must be persuaded by and have trust in their elders. I'm going to unpack all these in just a minute. Second, the laity must not resist their elders in their duties. Third, the laity must help to make their eldership a joy and not a burden. And fourth, the laity must be aware of the great benefit in having eldership. So let me unpack those four principles, four observations. Again, the first one here, the congregation, I'm going to just start using a different language, but that's what I'm talking about. The congregation must be persuaded by and have trust in their elders. So most translations of this particular passage are, are going to render into English, as mine has, the command to quote, obey. And it's not incorrect. That's, that's a perfectly fine way to interpret that word, the Greek word. But it's actually not the most common way that this word is used in the New Testament. Paul will say to Philemon, you know, I preached on Philemon briefly uh, for Carolyn when she, during, uh, for her retirement. Philemon, verse 21, Paul says this to Philemon. Again, we, we hopefully remember what he's talking. He's telling Philemon to receive Onesimus back no longer as a slave but as a brother. And he says, Paul says to Philemon, having confidence, which is that word that gets rendered as to obey in Hebrews, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, says Paul, since I know... There's the confidence that Paul has in Philemon. I know that you will do even more than what I say. Again, just go back and read Philemon if you don't understand what's going on. But Paul makes it clear he's encouraging Philemon to welcome Onesimus back as a brother, as a friend, and no longer as a slave. Paul is able to say this to Philemon, one, because I think Philemon is an elder in the church in Colossae. That's just my opinion. Others may agree or disagree. But I think Paul, as the apostle, is saying, I have confidence in your obedience. I know that you will do this. How does Paul know that Philemon will do this? It's because I believe that there is a mutual respect and trust between Philemon and Onesimus 
or excuse me, Philemon and Paul, excuse me. And it's based on a shared ethic. It's based on a shared ethic. And of course, you go back in Philemon, you'll understand that that ethic is Christ. Paul and Philemon may have different political views. They may have different uh, statuses in life. They may, they may be complete polar opposites. I don't actually know. One day, maybe we'll find out in heaven. But it doesn't matter. Because in Christ, Paul and Philemon are brothers. And Paul is confidently speaking not to Philemon as a Colossian, not to Philemon as a Roman, not to Philemon as a slave master, but he's speaking to Philemon as a brother in Christ, one who loves and shares the same ethic. And so we, as Christians, again, coming back, bringing back to Hebrews, the congregation, the laity, must not just be confident, if you will, in your elders. That's, that's there. There needs to be a confidence in your elders, but that confidence needs to be based in that they are trying to persuade you to grow in spiritual maturity. Because we see that's exactly what Paul is doing to Philemon. He wants Philemon to mature and say, look, welcome Onesimus back no longer as a slave, but as a brother. I have the apostolic authority to make you do it, but I'm not going to appeal to that. I'm going to appeal to your love in Christ. That's the summary of Philemon. And so we come then to trying to understand this word that says obey. It's actually used different times in Acts. In Acts chapter 17, verse 4, 18, verse 4, 19, verse 8, Paul is recorded as trying to persuade the people, and specifically he's talking about the Jews in the synagogue. Paul is attempting to persuade people about the kingdom of God. So as we're trying to understand what does it mean to obey your leaders, we have to try and understand that there, it comes with it this having a confidence that these elders are doing what they should be doing, which is what they should be doing is what I just preached on from just moments ago from Acts chapter 20. That is the rubric, the test, that the congregation should weigh on their elders. Are they doing that? And if so, obey them. The shared ethic that, again, I mentioned earlier with Paul and Philemon, for us, the shared ethic is this rubric of self-examination. That is what convinces the laity and persuades them to imitate their elders, not because of who their elders are, not because how much they may or may not have, not based on their race or gender, not based on anything like that. It's are they following the commands of Christ? And if so, obey them. Second thing he tells them, he doesn't just say obey, he says submit. Now this Again, most English translations render this word into the word submit, which again is not incorrect. But interestingly, this word only appears here. Nowhere else in the New Testament does the word that gets translated as submit appear in the Greek. But I think it conveys very clearly what it is. So elders who are in the act of convincing and persuading their flock in this shared ethic of scripture, they should be submitted to. That word, that Greek word literally means to yield under. To yield under. So you all know what that upside down triangle sign on the highway or as you enter the highway says, it's white with a red border, right? You all passed your, uh, your driver's tests. What do we call that? A yield sign. Okay, what, does that mean stop if it's clear? No. Does it mean to blow, blow on, right on through very fast? No, it means to beware, to yield. If there's oncoming traffic, that means you need to slow down. There needs to be an awareness. That's the idea of yielding. So that's what this word means, is to yield under them. So when elders who are holding the flock accountable, again, to the rubric of self-examination, when they're doing their job, 
The laity, the congregation, should yield to them. So a congregation, here's why I want you to understand how that works. What does it mean to yield? So a congregation under biblical eldership should, when we think about the word yield, they should surrender all pride. Or another way, another synonym of yield is to capitulate all self-righteousness. So what you are doing as a congregation, come submitting yourself to the eldership, is that you are surrendering all sense of self-righteousness, all sense of pride, all sense of arrogance, all sense of, of I know more than them. If that's true, then you become an elder. If it's not true, then obey and submit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who has put them in charge over you. Yield themselves to the nurture of the elders. Doing this is hard but important work. But when it's done, it's done, should be done as a joy. Paul makes clear that the work of eldership is a fine thing to desire. He tells that to Timothy when he gives the qualifications of eldership. It's a fine thing to desire to be an elder. And the author of the epistle to the Hebrews also knows that the joy of eldership, because there should be joy, there is joy there, he knows that the joy of eldership can and sometimes is undercut when the congregation makes that work a burden. Being an elder is and should be a joy. And the only reason why... He, he says the only reason why. I would say maybe one of the big reasons why. I might be a little bit more gracious than the author here. One of the reasons why is an unruly congregation. The church should make every effort to bring joy to her elders and not grief. How do you bring joy to your elders? The author is very clear. By obeying and submitting to the rubric that God has laid down. It's as black and white as that. There's no gray area. God's pretty clear. How do congregations make it a burden? Well, I'm sure there are many answers to that. But I think they all fall under one. And it's a lack of communication. Talk to your elders. Even if whatever you have to say is not good, air quotes, because only God gets to define what is good or not. Even if what you have to say is not good, they need to hear it from you. And not through the grapevine. Not from the rumor mill but from the horse's lips. They don't need to hear it months or years after the fact. They need to hear it now. And notice the fourth and final thing here. Doing this hard but important work is beneficial. Your elders, I can tell you this, and as we talked about yesterday, the elders are not in it to get rich. Sorry, Cynthia, there's, there's no paycheck with this one. Your elders are not in it to get rich. They're not in it to parade themselves around as holier-than-thou Christians. Nor are they there to gain some sort of cult following. And if they are, kick them out. But that's not what they're there for. And I don't think our elders are there for those things. They're not there to get rich. They're not there to parade themselves around. And they're not there to gain a following. So godly leaders, says the epistle, are a benefit to your life. Now, does that mean elders are a benefit to every aspect of your life? No, probably not. So what is it that he's talking about here? I think he's talking about they are a benefit to your life, first of all, as members of this body. Because we are members one of another. That relationship between laity and eldership is important. 
And again, that role is a beneficial role, mutually beneficial role for one another. But not only that, not just in this time and space, but I also think there's a great benefit to godliness. Because again, go back to what the elders are to be doing. That rubric of self-examination that they do for themselves and they're alert for the congregation and nourishing it in them. Those things produce eternal blessings, church. If you don't believe it, you got to reread the Bible. Go back to those six biblical rubrics and if you are striving, again, I'm not saying you have to be perfect in them, but if they are present or if they are increasing, that's a very good thing. It's a benefit for all of us because of what Christ has applied. So let me conclude with this. Why, why do we elders do this? Why would we go through all this work? I can't answer for any of them. You can ask them. You know who they are and the others elect. You ask them. I can only speak for myself, and so I shall. I do this hard and important work because I am a watchman held accountable to God. I, and you all, but that's, you know, again, you need to make, you need to voice that yourselves. I'm voicing mine. I will stand before God on that great day of judgment. And he will look at me and say, Ed, when you were pastor, how did you serve me? And I have to be able to stand and say, hopefully with the Apostle Paul, I fought the good fight. I stood with zeal on the gospel and the truth. Hopefully you can as well. I'm accountable to God first and foremost for my own self-examination. But as an elder, I'm also accountable to God for my own way of leading you in self-examination. And so I want to leave you with the rubric one more time and then we'll close. That rubric, if you weren't writing it down, now's a good time to do it. Trust in Christ, obedience to God, Growth in holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, love for other Christians, and a positive influence on others. May these attributes and more, because it's certainly not exhaustive, be applied to you and increase in you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, I do want to thank you so much for giving to us the structure that you have presented in Scripture you are the one who, who calls elders to lead within your body as under shepherds, as representatives and examples of Christ, the great good shepherd. God, I thank you for that great privilege and opportunity that I have to serve as an elder and these other elders have to serve as well. I thank you for those who have served in the past and those who are coming on. Lord, I pray that we can continue to serve you, being held accountable to you, trusting in you, obeying you, growing in holiness, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, loving one another, and being a positive influence beyond these walls. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit continue to foster these in me, in our elders, and in this church. We pray all of this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends, our final hymn this morning comes from the Black Hymnal, Hymns of Grace, number 393. <laughs> Take my life and let it be. I invite you to stand and join with me.
benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Now in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world and serve your Lord. Amen.